you can turn over to Revelation chapter 11. And while you're turning, I'll just share a few things. Um, it seems like in the times we live in, I'm all, there's always something to share or something to comment on either before or during the teaching. And this week, a lot of people are excited, and I've been getting questions. Even Friday night at the uh, town square, I was getting questions about the, uh, the peace treaty that was signed this week between the United States and Israel and the United Arab Emirates or the UAE. How many of you saw that? Okay, that's a good number of you. And, and it, indeed, it was uh, historic in uh, some ways. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Of course, earlier in this year, President Trump signed what's called the, uh, the deal of the century with Israel. Y'all saw that one, right? Um, planning to annex uh, more land that belonged to Israel, the West Bank, and all that kind of stuff. And that was starting to get hindered, as I shared with you, especially with the coronavirus um, and all of the things going on in our country, elections coming up. And so um, our president kind of has been quiet about that. But even more so, all the protests that have been happening in the area, in the land of Israel, not just from the Palestinians, but also the Israelis themselves, the, the, especially the young Israelis, really protesting against that. Because as I told you, Israel is mainly and mostly a secular society right now. We know that, right? <clears throat> and so, but this is different. Even though Israel has a, a peace deal with Egypt and they, uh, they have um, already, yeah, and one with Jordan, thank you. Um, those have already been in place, um, meaning that they're not enemies and at war with each other. But this one's different because the UAE and Israel are going to be more than just not at war with each other. But it's going to be a very diplomatic, friendly type of arrangement between the two countries. And uh, many believe that other Arab countries will come on board. And so everybody's wondering, does this have anything to do with uh, the peace treaty that Daniel chapter 9 talks about that the Antichrist will come in and confirm or strengthen. And my answer is, it's not that. However, it's laying the groundwork for that, I believe. It's getting things lined up because as if more Arab countries come on board with this, it's going to make things very interesting. Because the reason that they were able to make this deal is Israel had to agree to suspend all their annexations, which is going to benefit the Palestinians. So it is possible that this is just simply laying the groundwork for the one that is to come uh, moving in that direction. The interesting thing about all of this, and we got to think about it from this perspective, and, and this may be what triggers the final agreement to happen, is that the main thing, one of the main things that we know that's going to happen in Israel coming up is that Iran is going to decide to invade Israel along with Ethiopia and Libya and a major uh, political government from the north. And Ezekiel chapter 38 tells us that God is going to put hooks in, in Gog, the prince of Magog, um, in the land of um, Rush and, and Tubal, and he's going to draw them in. And they're going to come in along with Persia, who is Iran, Ethiopia, and Libya, Libya to invade Israel. And at that point, supernatural fireworks are going to go off, if you will, because God is going to supernaturally destroy that invasion. And, uh, and save Israel. And that's what Ezekiel t uh, chapter 38 tells us. That is what we're looking to see happen. There's a couple of other little things in prophecy that will take place in and around that. None of that hinders the church from, from being raptured because that's an imminent thing. There's no prophecy that has to be fulfilled. But we're living in times where so many of these things are happening so quickly. And it's interesting. And everybody's concerned right now about in the Middle East about Iran. Our, is, either Israel or America or both have been bombing Iran's nuclear sites. Y'all been seeing this, right? Um, literally bombing them over the last month, taking out many of their nuclear sites. It's most likely Israel or it's America and Israel. But if it's Israel, America knows about it and they're staying quiet because we got an election. <laughs> so, so all of those things are happening. And it's almost like the Bible is, uh, is just kind of like, you know, jumping off the page is, is happening. One of the other aspects of this listening, along with all of these prophetic things lining up, and I'm only talking about this stuff because we're in the book of Revelation, is that also the world is being more and more prepared for a global government which will uh, have complete global control over the population of the earth. 
okay? And that is what Satan desires to do, and we'll get into that in the teaching today. And one of the things I, I want to show you a picture on the screen, the same nation, the United Arab Emirates or the UAE, which is, which is one of the most powerful Arab nations in the Middle East, the same country, they're trying now to build what's called, um, let me see if I can find it here in writing, it's called the, um, the Abrahamic Family House of worship, which will include a Jewish synagogue, a Christian church, and a Muslim mosque on the same property, all united and happy together, which you imagine that happening. And uh, of course, the, the Pope is really behind that as well. And that's in the same area, the same country that's now entered into this deal with Israel and the United States, um, which is probably going to continue to grow with other Arab countries. Very interesting how things are beginning to shape up. And around the world, because of the pandemic, you can take that down, because of the pandemic that's going on around the world, the world is becoming more and more accustomed to inflicting control against the populations of the world. Uh, there are questions that have come up as drug makers are getting very close to having vaccines. Several of the questions that have emerged is could governments require people to get the vaccines? And uh, a lot of people are saying, in fact, yes, that could happen, um, that they could compel people to take the vaccines um, in order to enter into certain parts of society and that it should be actually required. Um, and so those are things that are coming. There could be fines. There could be uh, taxes imposed. Um, there is a councilwoman in Nashville who recommends that murder charges or attempt of murder charges should be brought against people who refuse to wear masks. Um, that's in our country. Um, you know, and in, there, in uh, what country, what city was it? Um, Milwaukee Journal uh, reported that um, the Department of Natural Resources uh, are requiring their employees to wear masks um, when they're home and on Zoom calls so that people can see that they are, if you will, promoting the narrative uh, that's going out into the world today. Um, and, you know, I do understand that, uh, well, I don't actually. <laughs> I think that uh, it's important that the church simply understand some things which, you know what, will let the word speak for itself. Turn to Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. Let's stand and read down to verse 19, and then we shall dive in and see what thus says the Lord in the midst of all this chaos. We there say amen. amen. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. My goodness. And the 24 elders will, who sat before God on their thrones fell down or fell on their faces, excuse me, and worshiped God, saying, we give, thank, give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the, and the saints. And those who fear your name shall uh, name small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and earthquake. And great hell. And Father, we do thank you this morning as we turn to your word, Lord God, that you have given it to us, that you have loved us, that you have informed us, Lord God, that you have given us not only your word, but your Holy Spirit to lead and guide us and teach us and comfort us, Lord God. And, and so we surrender to you now and we ask that you would remove everything from our hearts and minds that hinder us from hearing your voice, that you would remove the distractions even from this room, Lord God, that you would grab our attentions, all of us, Lord God that you would do a work in us, that we would leave this place different than the way we came in, that we would be continuously more conformed to the image of your son, that we would know who you are and your perfect will for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen. Amen. You all may be seated. 
And so they get on me for not getting my titles done early. Um, so this one we will call uh, Thy Kingdom Come. And uh, Thy Kingdom Come is the, is the title. And so it's just a wonderful passage of scripture. As we dive in, we'll just jump in and let the, let the text do the review for us. Notice in verse 15 it says, Then the seventh angel sounded which is amazing. This is the last of the seven trumpets, the seven angels with the seven trumpets, which is about the sound. We know seven is the number of completion. So this, the sounding of this trumpet is bringing about the completion of something, which we'll see in a moment. In the first six trumpets, the six, first six angels, when they blew their trumpets, we saw God's direct wrath poured out upon the earth, right? You remember that? Remember as the, as the seals were being opened earlier, we saw kind of the indirect wrath of God, still God's wrath as as it was told to us, the wrath of the lamb in chapter six. But when we get into chapter seven and see the trumpets blow, it's directly being poured out upon the earth. And that's why we saw the silence in heaven for the space of a half an hour. And if you remember back in chapter eight, the first trumpet blow, blew and the vegetation was struck. You remember a third of the green trees and all the green grass was burned up. Y'all remember that one? Okay, man, y'all, you know, Y'all don't have coffee on Sunday mornings. Y'all with me? Are y'all excited to be here? Y'all know how it goes. It helps. And, you know, and so uh, the second trumpet blew. Remember that one? The sea was struck. A third of all the living creatures in the sea and a third of all the ships were destroyed. Remember we talked about this stuff. The third trumpet blew. All of the fresh waters were struck by wormwood. You can go back and listen to those chapters. The water became bitter or poisonous and men, men could not uh, drink it. And if you remember, the fourth trumpet blew. And when that trumpet blew, the heavens were struck in that the light was diminished. The sun, the moon, the stars were diminished by a third. All of these things changed the whole dynamic of the earth and it affected life on the on the planet greatly. All of the things that mankind has enjoyed being in this small little window of opportunity for life to exist in our universe. And we are in the perfect sweet spot for it. Yet with these trumpets blowing, those things were beginning to change um, if. And and so when the um, fifth trumpet blew, it really heated up, didn't it? That's when we saw an angel open the bottomless pit and we saw all kind of demonic things. These creatures come out kind of like locusts and how they swarm, but definitely not in how they look and how they sting. And they had the ability to torment men for five months. Men wanted to die and death would flee. Y'all remember this, right? Okay. And then when the, the sixth trumpet blew, the four angels that had been in prison by the great river Euphrates were unleashed and they killed a third of mankind, which brought us to a grand total of 50% of the population of the earth being killed in the first three and a half years of the tribulation or the first half of the tribulation. And if you remember, men still refused to repent of their drug use and their, and their idolatry, uh, basically the worship of demons and their sexual immorality, all of the things which are rampant in the earth today. And yet in all of that, God is still good and the church still has to be the church. We're going to go over to the abortion clinic. We're going to do ministry there. There's a ministry of ex-military and ex-police, retired police officers that I've just found out about, and I want to find out more about it, um, that are uh, working to rescue people from, from sex trafficking. As that, that stuff, as I read an article the other day, that sex trafficking has increased during the pandemic, not only because of the, uh, uh, I guess, the lockdowns and different things with kids not being in school, as well as with the wearing of the mask, uh, provides cover for certain things, you know? And all of those things are, are growing as well, as long, along with depression and drug use and alcohol. All of these things get magnified during this season, as we're, we're going to learn uh, our part to play in all of that. And so we saw those things happen, but now we've come to the seventh seal. The seventh seal. And so notice it says, then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven. And this is very different from when the seventh trumpet blew. When the seventh trumpet blew, there was silence in heaven. Y'all remember that? There was silence in heaven when the, when the seventh trumpet blew because it was at the seventh trumpet that God was about to pour out his wrath. But now at the seventh, excuse me, the seventh seal, God was about to pour out his wrath. A lot of y'all caught that. I see you smiling. Thank you. But at the seventh trumpet, there's a celebration in heaven because of what God is about to do next. 
And so the seventh seal brought the wrath of God upon the earth, which brings God no pleasure. And that's why there was a silence in heaven for the space of 30 minutes before he poured out his wrath. But now at the seventh trumpet, there's about to be a change in government and all heaven is going to rejoice because of it. So notice it says that, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, here's what they were saying, check it out. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Very interesting language. Most of the, uh, uh, the scholars believe that it should be singular. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of uh, our Lord and, uh, and of his Christ. And either way, it's fine. We don't really have to get caught up in that. The point is Jesus is going to bring his kingdom and he's going to take over the earth. Amen. And establish his own kingdom, which is what we need because we can't find any type of righteous kingdoms upon the earth until Jesus comes. There will not be a righteous government. The things we see happening will continue to get worse. You have to understand once, uh, it, once it goes to a certain point, there's no returning, okay? Now, here's the thing we got to understand. The kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And it means that later down, they're going to say he's going to take his great power and reign because he's currently not reigning. Don't get me wrong. Jesus is in complete control right now, but Jesus has not begun to exercise his complete reign, obviously, because you look at what's going on, right? We, you see what's going on in the world. Jesus is not reigning yet, okay? He has given some time, which I'll come back to. So what we have to understand then is this, that there has been a transfer of power, unfortunately, a long time ago. Remember, Adam was given dominion. How many of you know that? Okay, remember on your screen, it tells us in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26, it says that then God said, let us make man in our image, something always to remember that we are made in the image of God. And so because we're made and we're also made to worship God. Amen. And I don't want to get into that right now. But so let us make man in our image and according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and over the cattle, over the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Adam was given complete dominion over all of those things as he was created by God uh, in God's image. And God was pleased with, with it all. And, and you know, and it's a, it was a wonderful thing. But Satan was able to strip Adam of his dominion by tempting him into sin. He deceived Eve and Adam went into sin. And there's a lot that we can learn about leadership and marriage and the order of things from just that story, which we don't have time to develop here right now. And, but that is what happened. Now, when Jesus showed up in his first coming, Satan decided that he was going to try to do the same thing with the Lord because he recognized the Lord and who he was. And so when uh, the Lord was here and he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, Satan tempted him on the screen. Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 through 11, it says, And again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain to show him all the kingdoms of this world in their glory. Listen. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Satan wants to be worshipped. Satan wants to be God, okay? And so he says, hey, Jesus, I got all the kingdoms of the earth, and if you would worship me, I'll give them to you. And Jesus doesn't argue with him or refute him. You notice that? You catch it? Because Satan has temporary reigning authority on the earth at this time. And notice what Jesus does. You got to catch this. So Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, listen to this, y'all, you shall worship the Lord God, and him only you shall serve. And then the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and ministered to him because he had been fasting for 40 days. And so Jesus basically defeats Satan using the same tools in which he's given us. I don't know if you caught that. He defeats Satan with the word. It is written. He resists him through the word, and the Bible says that if we would resist the devil, he will flee. You know, did you know that? Draw near to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. So Jesus literally defeats him using the same tools in which he has given us his, his word to be able to defeat the, the enemy. Jesus is the rightful ruler of the earth. He stripped Satan of all of that when he died on the cross and rose again. So he is the rightful ruler of the earth and mankind, but he has patiently listened, waited for his time 
to rule, allowing the gospel message to be preached and allow for man's iniquity be, to become full grown. There's these things, these pictures throughout scripture we see that God judges a society based upon its iniquity. And when it gets full grown, then he pours out his wrath. But he also shows his mercy in that as long as we are here and the, the, the Holy Spirit is working through us to preach the gospel. He is still drawing people to himself. Isn't that something? Through the foolishness of the gospel preach, it's an amazing picture of how God is choosing to work. So he says, my ambassadors are on the earth, and my spirit is in them, and I'm working through them. And another reason why churches are not, I, I don't believe, should be closed, quiet, or hiding in caves during this hour. Uh, that's my personal opinion. I don't want to. Uh, well, I don't care about offending. I, don't, I just want to make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. So these kingdoms, which are currently under Satan's control. Now, I want you to stay with me for a moment, okay? Because there's, a, there's I think, a complete picture here that I want to give you. Jesus taught us that we should desire and even pray for this particular kingdom that belongs to him. And he, told, he taught us that in the uh, Gospels, Matthew chapter 6, I'm going to read from verses 5 down, but we're only going to put on the screen verses 9 and 10. But it was there when Jesus says, when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. And surely I say to you, they have their reward, but you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your father, relationship, who is in the secret place. So Jesus says, hey, when you pray, you're going to spend some real quality uh, time in the secret place with your father who is in heaven. You catch that language, right? I love that. And it says, and your father who sees in secret will reward openly. And so there's something that happens in the secret place when we spend time with the Lord that's extremely important. And when you pray, do not use vain repetition. In other words, don't just do it in the flesh for religious purposes. For they think that they will be, uh, be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. For your father knows the things that you have need of before you ask. It's very interesting. He says, look, God already knows about all the stuff. It's okay to make your request made, made known to him, but then let the peace of God which surpasses all understanding rule and guard your hearts in Christ Jesus. So it's good to make the request, but we don't have to constantly in vain repetition, just always just using many words. We want to get to the heart of the matter. And this is what Jesus says in verse 9. He says, in this manner, therefore pray. On the screen, he says, our Father in heaven, recognizing that we have a relationship, a heavenly Father. Isn't that good? Because some of you didn't either, either didn't have good relationships with the father on earth or maybe you don't know him doesn't really matter you have a father in heaven and he loves you so he says our father in heaven hallowed or holy be your name you don't have to get king james on it just say oh father you're holy father i love you you're so holy and righteous and i'm coming to you and then he says this he should say you should say your kingdom listen your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven You know, most of you remember this prayer at some point in your childhood. We had to pray it before every football game, get in the huddle. That was our prayer. It was it was just repetition. Okay, half the guys, probably 90 percent of the guys didn't even know him, uh, their father in heaven, truly. But we prayed that prayer. But he said that we should pray that his kingdom, his kingdom. Listen, notice what he says again. Verse nine, our father in where? Amen. Amen. Holy is your name. So first we're praying to our father. We have access to our father who is not in this world but is in heaven. And your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the great desire. This is what Jesus is saying. Above all other things, church, above everything else that is in your heart and in your mind, the most important thing that we could ever look to see is that his kingdom from heaven would come and invade the earth because earth will suffer until that happens. We understand that? And this is what we desire. There is a kingdom that is coming and not only are we to pray for it and look for it and have that mentality, 
We are also to realize, and this is most important, that we are just passing through this current kingdom and our citizenship is actually already in the heavenly kingdom. And this is what he taught us in Philippians. And so in Philippians on your screen, chapter 3, I'm going to read verse 17 down because you need to get the whole picture. He says, brethren, join in following my example, Paul's writing. Paul says, follow the example of the apostles and those who live the same way who give up their life and forget the things that are behind and search and move and press towards the, the high mark of Christ Jesus. We follow those who say to live, what did he say? To die is gain, right? To live is Christ. Thank you. That's not in my nose. And to die is gain. Amen. Well, that, that's something that's hard to swallow, but we're called to it. He says, for many walk, listen, of whom I've told you often and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Some of them come on your TV screens. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, meaning they're covetous. Whose glory is their shame. Why? Because they set their mind on earthly things, such as the prosperity false prophets and many of the other new age false prophets. But notice he says, for our citizenship is where? In heaven. Everything that you can covet on this earth will burn. But our citizenship is in heaven, a heavenly kingdom from which we eagerly wait for the for our, notice he says for our uh, wait for our savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Who will transform our lowly body that it might be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able to subdue all things to himself. And I don't want to spend too much time there, but this is what we need to begin to realize that we belong to another kingdom. And the kingdom we're currently living in is that of this world. And that implies some things that we really need to learn in the time that we currently live in. Okay, you with me? All right. So, because we are occupying enemy territory on earth, because that the kingdom we live in is an earthly kingdom and it has its own ruler and its own governmental system, and that we are of a totally different one, we need to recognize things for what it is. And here's what the, the scriptures actually tell us. In 2 Corinthians on the screen, verse 4, stay with me. You should be writing these down, by the way. I forgot to tell you. First service took notes really well. Write these down and go through them this week. Paul said it this way. He says, but even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. And sometimes the gospel seems like it's veiled because it seems like as time goes on and as things get worse, that you know, our preaching is almost in vain. It's falling on deaf ears, it seems sometimes. And, and the world is becoming so antagonistic towards not only the gospel message, but Christianity itself. We know that, right? We see that more and more and more and more. And it's very evident when you can do so many other things like abort a child, you know, uh, you know, and everything else and you can do, yet the church must shut up and be quiet and don't meet. They didn't say meet at home, don't meet, you know, basically is what they're saying. And this is what we need to understand. So the, the world is becoming antagonistic. So it's veiled to those who are perishing, but notice it says whose minds, notice the God of this age has blinded. So there is a God of this current age. And he's also called the little God of this world, little G. Satan, who, who's blinded the minds of, of those who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them, which is why we're called to continue to preach in this time where darkness is so rampant. Listen, there is a veiling, there is a blindness that's going on by the ruler of this age, yet the church must continue to press forward. Y'all understand that? Because there is a kingdom of this world that we are not a part of. And so we, listen, if we could get a good, solid understanding of this or, or could learn to focus on the real spiritual reality that we're discovering in these verses, then I think we could become more effective both in not only winning souls but waging warfare. And here's why. Ephesians chapter 6. Write it down and it's on the screen. Listen to me very carefully. Paul says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that notice you may be able to withstand in the evil day. 
and having done all this stand. And I love that, to be able to withstand in the evil day. I used to think that the evil day came every now and then. In other words, there'll be some evil days, and when I get to one of them, I'll be able to stand if I put on the whole armor of God. I, I think that we're living in the evil day, meaning that not just a 24-hour period of time, but we're living in a time of evil. And Paul says we should redeem the time because the days are evil. Walking circumspect, having our eyes open, understanding that we're uh, occupying enemy territory in a kingdom that we don't belong to because we have citizenship into another kingdom. And the, the host of wickedness and the rulers of this age recognize you don't belong because you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise when you believe. And so they see you and recognize you as not being a part of their system. And Jesus says, if the world hates you, know that it hated me first. So don't fall in love with the world and think the world means you good. They really don't mean us any harm. They're just trying to help, you know. That's what they want you to think. And so as we look at this and we realize the truth, we then can recognize, listen, that Gavin Newsom is not the the enemy of the church in California, nor is any other liberal politician or anyone who is doing some of the things that we see that are coming upon the world, they are not our enemies. Any of the people that are used to, to do any of the things that we see, the destruction of our country that's going on, but the people who are actually carrying that out, they're actually not our enemy. You know, the man who ran across the yard and put a bullet through the five-year-old kid's head, unfortunately, he's still not our enemy. And we have to recognize that, yes, we do have an enemy, and he's puppeting not only government officials, but people who have rejected the love of Jesus Christ. That, and, and these people are being puppeted and manipulated by the enemy. And we got to recognize it for what it really is, because I believe that once we begin to get a hold of that and recognize it, at least I can speak for myself, it begins to change my way of thinking as it relates to what I have stewardship over, which is the leadership of, this, of my family first and in this church. And, and so now, starting yesterday, my prayer life for you changed a little because I realized something. Second Corinthians on the screen, verse 10, chapter 10. Listen. And this is what I, I want every pastor and leader and, and, and husband and wife and a mother and people to realize. He says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. And even casting down, look, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And so as I began to pray yesterday... I began to realize this, okay, if I'm where God placed me to be as both a husband and a pastor, then there's a bit of authority that comes with that. And so in the spirit realm, starting yesterday, I began to pray over everyone connected to this church. I, I'm not going to debate stuff. I don't want to talk about this. I, I will say you really need to turn CNN off because it will, it, it will destroy your understanding and Fox. You need to find better news, and there is better news out there. The best is the Bible. And so then if that's the case, then my prayer began yesterday for all of us is that God would push back the work of the enemy as it relates to Calvary Chapel because that's where I have stewardship of Clayton, that is, that he would push back the, 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 the enemy and he would lift any cloud of deception that could be on us, that we can hear his voice clearly, see what it is that he desires for us to do, that he would lead us and guide us and only him, and that all that other stuff would be moved out of the way. So that, and I said, Lord, push back like the boundary, if you will, broaden it out a little bit so everybody can fit in. That's what I desire. Not to debate things, but just so we can be prepared for the season that is before us. And I even felt like I had the authority to pray that for Clayton. And then when I, when I tried to pray that for the country, I ran out of steam for some reason. I didn't have any spiritual energy to do that. I don't know why. I think maybe because America's done. Possibly. I don't know. I don't want that to be the case. But for you all and our families in this town, I prayed that. And I believe that God wants us to be that way. And I believe he wants us to occasionally be in the square and show the town 
that, you know, because they, were, they weren't drinking coffee across the street from us, by the way. They started drinking alcohol at night, you know. <laughs> you know, but we, we're there to be a light, to show them, hey, the church is there. We're normal. We're not weird. Well, I mean, for the most part. <laughs> Jesus freaks, I guess. But, but that we're normal and that we, we love and that we can pray and that we can encourage. And so this is how we have to begin to operate. Because now I can push all of the other stuff aside. And this is what we need to do. And look, I, we, I want to go to my heavenly father and ask him on our behalf to wage war against the enemy, the real enemy that is pressing upon us. You know, look, we can pray now, Lord, move the enemy out of the way. Draw those women who want to have abortions there that day and move the enemy away and give us opportunity the women of this church who are in the women's ministry, opportunity to engage them in a healthy way and, and for us to reach people. Uh, because what we have to understand is Satan wants to be worshiped. And one of the ways he gets his worship is when he can destroy life. However that is, he gloried in the fact that he could take a man and move upon him in a demonic fashion, whether some say it was uh, uh, drug use and some say it was mental illness. Satan used a man to put a bullet through a child's head and he glories in it. Okay? And so when we think about stuff like that, we got to get a grasp on things. And I think that we have to use spiritual wisdom and spiritual maturity and rise above the foolishness of this world and all of the stuff that's being argued about and see things through the eyes of the Holy Spirit that's in us and through the scripture and wage warfare and, and, and prayer in the way the Lord has taught us to. Because I think if the church does that, man, some stuff's going to happen and things will, 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 will change in the sense of many will come to salvation. We're not going to change where the world is headed because the scripture's already written. The scripture's already written. And so I had to get that out before you there. And um, notice the next part of this. So he says, still in verse uh, 15, that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Meaning that time is now short. There's three and a half years left. All out wrath is going to come upon the world and Jesus will return and establish a kingdom. And it's going to be a glorious kingdom of which we are going to be a part of. And as I keep reminding you um, that we will be back, we will return with the Lord to the earth. He will establish his righteous, perfect kingdom for a thousand years. And then those who are allowed to enter the kingdom as he divides the nations at his returns and puts one, some on the right and some on the left. And those on the right he invites into his kingdom, Matthew chapter 25, those on the left are cast out. And those who go into the kingdom in their human form will continue to multiply upon the earth during that thousand year reign. Y'all have heard this before, you know, but we will be, if you will, in our resurrected form, we'll be like the superheroes of the earth in some degree, carrying out the commands of our Lord Jesus. We'll have a body similar to his. Why? Because he said in the verse I read to you earlier that he's going to transform our lowly body to be fashioned like his glorious one, right? John says, we don't yet know what we're going to be, but we know that when we that see him, we will see him as he is because we'll be like him. Well, what was he like? Well, he walked into rooms with the door closed and said, peace be unto you. And everybody freaked out. That's, that's a glimpse. You know, he went places and did things and he was not hindered any longer. It's very interesting. He was able to sit and eat with the disciples, but it doesn't seem like he needed to eat because he was no longer flesh and blood. The way that, in the sense of what we are when we're human, in his resurrected body, it was different, and we will be similar. And it will be a glorious season where we'll serve the Lord Jesus Christ upon the earth. I don't know. I could end up being assigned right back in Clayton. I told you all that on Wednesday nights, and it's become very, I want to be in tropical areas, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. Good thing about being in a resurrected body is, you know, when I'm on break, I'll just think it and go there. And, and get back on time. You never be late. <laughs> this is the stuff because time won't even hinder us. We don't even get a glimpse. We can't even fathom what's coming. We'll talk about it a little bit more in a few verses down. Verse 16. And I want to say this before I move on. Because we don't see his dominion yet. Jesus has the right to rule. He has the legal ownership of the earth. He paid the price for it. 
with his blood when he defeated death and, and, and sin on the cross. And the father officially gave him the legal document in Revelation chapter 5. We saw that, right? Y'all remember that. But here it's being proclaimed that the time for Jesus to exercise it in full is coming upon the earth. In verse 16, it says, and the 24 elders, notice, the 24 elders, these are the, the guys who represent the church. And we don't have time. You can go back and listen to Revelation 4 and 5. But the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell down on their faces and worshiped him. And it's hard for us to fathom why they do this in heaven. They fall down and they worship him. But it's because not just of how amazing he is, but how, uh, how brilliant he is. The Bible says his manifold wisdom and how he's worked these things out. And they will just simply fall down and constantly worship him and will do the same. And notice it says in verse uh, 17, they're saying this in their worship because wor their worship is vocal. Notice it says, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty. The one who is, the one who was, and is to come because you have taken your great power and reign. In other words, we give you thanks because now the time has come for you to take all of your power and really begin to reign on the earth where we will see uh, the results of Jesus' righteous government as he returns and begins to reign. But now I want you to look at the verse very carefully because this is something I need to do, but I won't spend a lot of time on it. Notice it says, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty. The one who is and the one who was, and some of you have a Bible in your hand that stops there. Some of you have a Bible that says, and who is to come, and, and that's a good thing. And you, you would say, well, Pastor Kevin, what's wrong? I don't want to have a Bible that doesn't have all the stuff it's supposed to have in it. And some of you say, well, Pastor Kevin, what's wrong? I don't want to have the Bible that has stuff in it that ain't supposed to have it. <laughs> and, and so what you got to understand, first of all, is the best Bible is the one that you actually spend time reading. Because a lot of people got Bibles and they just sit on the coffee table or in the back of the car and stuff and, or on their office desk and it looks like something, but they ain't really, really using it, okay? So the best Bible is the one you're reading, first of all. But the thing I want you to understand is there is a difference between how texts have been translated, and I don't want to get deep. I just want to say this, that there is a literal translation of a text word for word to complete it. And then there is a thought for thought translation, meaning that they take the gist of what it said and try to summarize it or it, through what's called a paraphrase. OK, that's the difference. You get me? OK. And what I want to say to you is for those you, it's good that you have that little extra part in there. And so maybe you should consider using multiple translations when you study if you're confused by this or if your Bible left this out. Because the part that's there in my text that may not be in your text is important because it speaks to something extremely important to us, which is the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because look at the verse. We give thanks, thanks we give you thanks, excuse me, O Lord God Almighty. So they're thanking the Lord God. Then they talk about the Lord God by saying the one who um, the one who is because he's eternal, the one who was because he's from old and everlasting, as the book of Daniel says, and because he is to come and all of this is God. And who is the part of God who's going to be coming? Jesus Christ, the Trinity. Now, if you struggle with the, the Trinity or you struggle with his deity, we see it throughout Scripture. In Revelation chapter 1, Jesus called himself the Alpha and Omega. In Revelation 1, verses 17 down, it says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand on me and said to me, Do not be afraid, because I am the first, he says, and the last. Jesus speaking is in red. I'm he, and how we know? Because says, I'm he who lives and was dead, and God the Father has never been dead, nor God the Holy Spirit, only God the Son has been dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore because the, the whole Trinity was working through the cross, but Jesus is the one that went to the cross. The Bible says that God raised Jesus from the dead. The Bible says the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus says I have the power to raise myself from the dead. Who, who, who raised Jesus from the dead? God. All right. Now, Titus 2.10 says this, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of our God and Savior in all things. I like that, God and Savior. Titus 2.13 says, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thomas, I don't have it, 
touched him and put his hands in, in, in his hole because he didn't believe. And he said, my Lord and my God. You can go read that in John. And Isaiah says this, I am the Lord. That is my name. I like that. <laughs> and my glory I will give, I will not give to another, nor my praise to carve images. So he says, I'm, the, I'm God and I ain't giving my glory to no other. Hosea 13, 4 says, yet I am the Lord your God ever since the land of Egypt. And you shall know, no God before me. You shall know no God before me, for there is no Savior besides me. Amen. Colossians says that Jesus created everything, and in him, everything was created by him, and it, cons- and, and it consists in him, and he gets the preeminence. John in the gospel says that he was in the beginning with God and that he was God. And the writer of Hebrews says that, he is the brightness and the express image of the living God, and, and that he holds all things together by the word of his power. And I think it's very important that we understand as we move in these last times and everybody wants to scoff and mock everything that Jesus is God and he will reign. Every knee will bow. Every tongue shall confess one day that he is God. And so we might as well proclaim him now so they can hear it. Amen. So that's an important part of the verse I wanted to point out there. Verse 18. As we are down to the wire. Notice, and the nations, we can't really spend time here. The nations were angry. And your wrath has come. You know, we see that in Psalm chapter 2. The nations were angry. They were raging. um, As God is speaking to his son Christ who will reign one day. The nations are angry because the nations are puppeted, if you will, influenced by the God of this world, Satan. And we understand that from earlier verses. So the nations are angry. The nations are moving in the direction that they're going because they're being led by Satan. The Bible tells us in the, in the, the, later in the tribulation here that the beast, who is Satan literally incarnate, will lead the nations into battle against the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the nations are raging because the nations of this world have a leader. His name is Satan because they do not give glory to the God who created them. And on earth, right now, the only ones who are truly giving glory to God is the Christian church today. And if you still don't believe, if you just pay attention long enough, you'll see that the world is constantly trying to silence the Christian church. It's finally coming to America because it's been going on in other places. And if you don't, can't see clearly that the the persecution is coming. I'm praying that God will open your eyes and allow you to see that those things have arrived in an early form and will continue until the Lord removes us from the earth. So the nations were angry, but your wrath, notice he says, and your wrath has come. And the time, notice this, and the time of the dead that they should be judged. We know that the dead are going to be judged. As the wrath unfolds upon the earth, they're being judged. As he returns and he cast out those who had rejected, um, and they will, they will be in ho- if a holding cell of hell, if you will, for 1,000 years. And at the end of the 1,000 years, God will release Satan. This question came to me as, again for a little season so that he can test those who were born and lived during the millennial reign, but had never lived during this age that we live in now because we've all been tried and tested, but yet we believe in faith, amen? So they'll have that opportunity to do the same, and there'll be a few that will rebel with Satan, and then God will put that down. He will then throw Satan into the lake of fire. And then the, the, the great white throne judgment will be set up, and the Bible says that all of the dead, small and great, will be resurrected, to stand before the white throne judgment of God. And they will be judged according to their own works. And that's not good because man's works are full of sin. We are judged according to Jesus' work, right? Because we, we place faith in him. So, so I don't get judged before God based upon my own works uh, for salvation. I, I, I get judged based upon what Christ has done. I'm saved because of him. Then when I stand before him at the beam of seat, he reconciles all things and brings me and you into his kingdom. But the dead will stand before the white throne judgment and they will be sentenced to eternal separation from God with torment 
as they will be cast into the lake of fire. The Bible actually says that death and Hades are also cast into the lake of fire. And you want to know why? Because that'll be the end. And eternity will have no Satan. Eternity will have no death. Eternity will have no hell. Eternity will have no non-believers. You see, this is why he says here at the end that the, the dead should be judged and that you, notice, should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints. There are rewards coming, eternal rewards for those who believe. And notice he says, and, not, and, and those who fear your name. Now, if you are, are new to, um, to maybe Protestant Christianity or if you're new to Calvary Chapel, if you were formerly a, uh, a Catholic, um, and, you know, I want to make sure you understand that the prophets and the saints, the saints are not um, people who are proclaimed saints after they died because they might have done a miracle. Okay, I know that's how it's done. Saints scripturally are those who belong to God, who believe, who have his spirit. And that means that the saints are not just in New Orleans. That, that means that this morning in this room, there are saints. Okay, y'all with me? Okay, good. So if you are born again, you're a saint. You know, and so there are rewards coming. And those who fear your name, he says, those who reverence the name of Jesus, there are rewards coming. Do you reverence the name of Jesus? Is his name the sweetest name you know? Is it the name that gives you more, if you will, encouragement and comfort than any other name? You know, I know when you're young and you're dating ladies and maybe his name is John or David and his name just means a lot to you. You know, you hear his name or what. No, but the name of Jesus is so much better, isn't it? Yeah. We reverence that name. And so those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. And so he's got a plan for those who destroy the earth. There are those who destroy the earth and they think that human beings are not special, not made in like the image of a God. And so they don't have worth. And so therefore, they can do all types of things uh, to human beings and won't think twice about it. And there are those who are elite and rich and powerful who are doing that to us right now. And we need to understand that, okay? Verse 19, as we wrap up, y'all okay? Verse 19 says, then the temple of God was opened in heaven. And the ark of the covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and earthquake, and great hail. Wonderful verse. And I have to, I, we have to tell you, there's so much in this verse that we are yet to fully understand, and one day we will. But I want you to understand this, that it says that the temple of God was open in heaven. It's very interesting because there is no temple of God on earth today except the born again believers, right? You are the temple of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, okay? Other than you and I, there is no temple of God on earth today. The Jews have no temple, and the temple that they're going to build with the help of the Antichrist will not be the temple of God. The earth will have no temple until Jesus returns and builds his own temple. We know that, right? So therefore, every temple and every priesthood on earth is an abomination to the work, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, okay? Because Priest implies mediator. Bible says there's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for us all. Amen? So one, one priest, our high priest, he's the sacrifice, the high priest, and the king. He fulfills everything, Jesus Christ. But in heaven, the Bible says that the temple of God was opened at this point. It's very interesting that the temple was opened. There's a lot of openings throughout out the uh, book of Revelation. They're all special. Chapter 4, verse 1, remember that, that, that the door, there was a door of heaven open in chapter 1. John got caught up. Uh, Jesus opened the seals. We know that. The bottomless pit was open. That wasn't so good. The temple of God here is open. We know that. Heaven will be opened again in chapter 19 when Jesus returns. The books will be open at the great right throne judgment. These openings are very interesting, but this one is God's temple in heaven is open. And notice the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And that's very interesting because we know that on earth there was an ark of the covenant, which was a type. Everything we saw in the tabernacle was a foreshadow of that which was in heaven. We know that, right? The thing is, we don't know where the ark on earth ended up. Nobody knows. And it's very interesting, though, that when De Jeremiah is warning them of the coming invasion of Nebuchadnezzar, he talks about the things that will be taken 
to Babylon, but he does not mention the most special of all of the things in the tabernacle or the temple, which would have been the Ark of the Covenant. He doesn't mention it. And many believe he doesn't utter it at all because maybe he hid it. That's a possibility. In fact, there are those who believe that Jeremiah gave it or took it down to Ethiopia. And there's a group of people who, in, in Ethiopia, I won't get into all that, who claim to be actually keeping the, the, the Ark of the Covenant. There are Jews in, in Jerusalem that say they know where the Ark of the Covenant is. However, nobody has seen the thing for thousands of years, okay? Um, it was not in the temple that Herod built. Nobody's seen it since right before the Jews went into captivity, okay? And the temple that they're going to build, they'll, they'll, they'll make one and put it in there, but God's glory won't dwell there. Y'all with me? Now, it could be that God allows the thing at some point here in the end to be dug up or produced for some purpose. We don't know. But the ark that we are looking at here is his true ark in heaven where he is, and that will be seen in the temple. And then notice the thing that we see often with his presence. And even when God uh, descended upon Mount Sinai in the Old Testament, lightnings and noises and thunderings and earthquake and great hail, which is, you know, check that. We're going to see some big hail coming in some previous some uh, chapters to come. So all of this happens on this day when they proclaim the final hour of humanity on earth before Jesus returns as he's, his wrath is being poured out and he's preparing to come and rule and reign. And that's what we want to see. So listen, as we close, I'm over time by a good amount. So we just, let's just pray. We got to close. All right. Father, we do thank you today for being with us, Lord God. I pray that you would continue to use your word in our lives, that you would continue to open our understanding, Lord God, that we would uh, just be blessed. As we go out of this place today, Lord, be with us. Keep us in our cars, our homes, our marketplace, work. Uh, wherever we go, whatever we do, Lord God, that you would protect those who are here under the, and even under the sound of my voice online this week. Lord God, giving us wisdom and supernaturally covering our lives and our families, Lord. We do love you. We do thank you. We give you honor and praise because you are our God. And we humble ourselves before you, Lord, because we have no power in order to take care of ourselves. But we fully rely on you and we acknowledge you for what you do. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing.